Thank you. All right, you're all very welcome to North Clare Community Church. It's our privilege to have so many visitors from the east side, and um, I'm sure not everybody's a dub, but you're based in Dublin, so today you're dubs. And uh, so yeah, when east meets west, and we're all one in Christ, so praise the Lord. Uh, Today, would you grab a Bible? If you don't have a Bible, you can put up a hand here. Usher, we'll get you a Bible. And uh, we're in the book of Joshua. So let's turn there. You're all very welcome. Uh, Praise God for the wild Atlantic West. It's good to be here. And um, today, I'll do a little summary. If you need a Bible, just keep your hand up, and one of the ushers will get you a Bible. Today, we're in the book of Joshua. The last time I spoke, we were um, in the book of Joshua. We were comparing it to, um, you know, the, the Israelites that came out of Egypt. They came out of bondage. They went into, they came through the baptism of the, the Red Sea into the desert, um, 40 years in the desert where they learned to hear the voice of God, where they learned uh, sp- to have a spiritual life. And then Moses died, Joshua takes over, and they're crossing over to a new beginning, um, a, l- a place where they were going to be used by God to take hold of the promises that the promise that had been made to Abraham to give the people the land. And we looked at how that was such a great picture of our own lives. Praise the Lord. We've been taken out of the slavery of sin in bondage and we've been baptized, been set free. And God has taught us. You know, in, the, in Deuteronomy there, in the desert, God talked about that we went through those trials, that we would learn that we, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, that God allowed us and allowed Israel to go through these challenges so that we would learn what's in our hearts. Anybody here have an idea what's in your heart? Yeah, it's an advantage to know what's, what our hearts are capable of. <clears throat> so, and that we would learn to live by the Word of God. So that was the picture we looked at. And this, this new beginning, uh, God speaks to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous. That God was with him. As God was with Moses, God speaks to Joshua. I am with you. I w-, and everywhere you put your foot, God says. And so this is the whole book of Joshua. There's this beautiful picture for us of life in the Spirit, life being used by God, being led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, there's just so many uh, great um, um, paradigms there with that. And in the last study, it was called A Vision of Great Things. You should have been here. It was awesome. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but we looked at that, Joshua, fresh start. The miracle of the separating of the Jordan, where they stepped in with the ark. They had to step into the water. That picture of faith. And and just, you know, how the people on the opposite side of the Jordan, they heard about what God had done. The miracle. And God, you know, our lives, our testimony, a testimony of a changed life. The world, Ireland has heard the testimony of our lives, the miracle God has done in our lives. And then you look at at Jericho, you know, uh, Joshua meets, last time we were in chapter 6, and Joshua meets uh, the commander of the Lord's army. He meets the Lord, and then God gives him a plan, and he goes, and there's this great victory of Jericho. And the whole idea there that we looked at last time was that um, to trust in the Lord with all our heart, and to lean not on our own understanding. This was something God was doing. It wasn't something that we were to figure out. Life in the promised land is life going by faith rather than it's like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. And not to be discouraged, not to be afraid. Praise the Lord. This is life of faith. It's kind of like walking on water. So, and all of that Uh, was based on God's word, the foundation in chapter 1 there, where God says to Joshua to meditate on my word day and night. So, can I ask you a question? Who here expects great things of God? Who here wants to attempt great things for God? Who here wants to accomplish great things 
for God. And, you know, we're here, like in, the, the, in Joshua, the book of Joshua, the previous generation had died off. Now, we want people to live long lives, but they had died off. And it was a new generation. God was going to use them. So this is where we're at today. And, and I'm going to re- finish uh, my introduction with the last verse in chapter 6. Uh, after the great victory of Jericho. Woohoo! <clears throat> Picture of how God gives us victories. There's that line that says, Joshua chapter 6, verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the country. But chapter 7 starts with a but. So let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for life in the Spirit, Lord. Just going by faith, Lord. Going by, not by sight, Lord. Uh, Thank you that you're with us. You don't want us to be discouraged. You don't want us to be afraid, Lord. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, speak, encourage, correct if necessary, Lord, us today. Because, Lord, we desire, Lord, to attempt, accomplish, and to to do great things for you, God, in this age. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, chapter 7 starts with a but. And um, so I'll pick it up. Uh, I'm going to read chapter 7, verse 1. Here it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed or the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, of the tribe of Judah, he took of the devoted or the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So what is this devoted or this accursed thing that, uh, that Achan took? Um, it, it tells us actually back in Jericho, back in chapter 6, um, on the day when Joshua shouts, on the seventh day when they were, they'd practiced going around the city, uh, they blew the trumpets, uh, Joshua told them to shout, and he says, only Rahab the harlot shall live and their family, and in verse 18 of the last chapter, it tells us what the accursed thing was, and it says, and you will by all means abstain from the accursed or the devoted things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So this is the principle of first fruits. The first fruits were always to be to God. And the essence of worship is that putting God first. Like what Steve said at the start, is that Christ is preeminent above all other things. Because God gave them the victory there in chapter 6 in Jericho, there wasn't to be any confusion that God was going to have all the spoil. It was consecrated. In the next battle, they they were allowed to take the spoil. They were allowed to take the good stuff. But this victory, God says, don't touch the glory. Don't touch it. So Joshua doesn't know any of this, and that somebody has stolen the spoil. And we'll pick it up in verse 2. This is what happens to Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel. And he spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up, and he spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua, and they said to him, Do not let the people go up, but just let two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before, but they ended up, they fled before the men of Ai. So after the victory of Jericho, there's a confidence. And it's like, nah, you don't need the whole army. Just send up two or 3,000. There's only, that Ives place, like Jericho was giant. This place is tiny. Just send up a few thousand. So God having done the victory, but there's a confidence, but this is a self-confidence. We can do it. Let's keep rolling here and let's see what happens. In verse 5, Joshua, um, verse 5, it says, The men of I struck down about 36 men. And for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shabaron and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and they became like water. 
a bit like the All Blacks. They beat Ireland. And then the next week, they fall to England. <laughs> so self-confidence is great in sport. But in a relationship with God, it's not. You know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So, defeat, it often comes after victory when we least expect it. So the hearts of the people melted. Something has changed. Not all is well. How quick that change. And, you know, this is... This is, can be a picture of our spiritual life, right? And um, in verse 6 then, Joshua and the leaders, let's see their reaction. Joshua, um, they tore his, he tore his clothes and he fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads and Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So Joshua's response is great. They go before the Lord. They, uh, they cry out to God until evening time. And that's great. They put dust on their heads. But even Joshua blames God. And you see that in verse 7. Why have you done this, God? And, you know, that's, we, we know that. We, disaster strikes and, and we just turn and blame God. But when we taste defeat, we can feel like quitting. We feel so discouraged. It's like, oh, all this seeking God. What's the point? And um, we can just say, forget about it. And fear sets in. In verse 8 and 9, it says there, the enemy is going to hear this and we're all going to be killed. And yes, Joshua has a thought for God. He says, God, what about your name? And verse 10, so I, th I think it's kind of encouraging that Joshua, even great Joshua, you know, this is where he's at. And just discouragement, that's real. It's like, that's part uh, something we are learning to overcome in our walk. So in verse 10, it says, it talks about the sin of Achan. It says, so the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both <coughs> stolen and deceived. And they've also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel cannot stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel... There is an accursed thing in the midst of Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing. And God tells Joshua what to do. So, and God tells Joshua, it's not a time for praying. It's a time to take action. You know, if, if Joshua, if they had prayed before, um, God would have uh, directed them before. So chapter six and eight, of the book of Joshua are chapters of victory. And it start, each, both of those chapters start with, and the Lord said. So it's as a response to prayer. But chapter 7, there is no, and the Lord says, and it ends in victory. So there's no mention of prayer. So this is self-confidence that's marked by prayerlessness. So, well... We can, see, we can say that, um, you know, sometimes we can become complacent and we can say, well, God did it that way the last time. Yeah, let's just keep going. You know, it worked the last time. Just keep going. But you, we know the Lord. He wants us to, um, to go to him, to inquire of him, seek him. Lord, what are you doing this time? That's, that's our challenge because we slip from relationship with the living God 
into just a strategy or it just, right? Humanity, come on. <laughs> so God says to Joshua, get up. They've both stolen and deceived, and they've put among them their own... God stuff. Therefore, verse 12, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies because they've become doomed to destruction. And so God explains why they are defeated, why they can't stand before the enemy. It's not that the enemy has gotten stronger, but it's got that God's people have gotten weaker because of sin. And we might ask, is that a bit over the top that the whole nation is, the whole all of God's people are doomed and defeated because of one man's sin. But it says in verse 11, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed. And so those two words, the word sin, it's that uh, word, the New Testament word is missing the mark. Um, you've got the bullseye, you've got the arrow, you hit the bullseye, that's great. <clears throat> but then you, you go again and you miss the bullseye. That's the word sin. It means missing the mark. But the word transgression is different. It refers to willfully disobeying or disregarding God's command. As in, okay, that's what God says. I'm just going to go this way. And this is what God is saying. Yes, they've sinned, but there's, a, there's this transgression. There's a willful disobedience. So we see how one person's willful disobedience defiles the whole camp and prevents the camp going forward. And we can ask ourselves, is that possible? And, but what we do know is that the Bible says a little leaven. This is the biblical principle, a little leaven. It leavens the whole lump. And we know that in Christ that we are one, we are a body. So if the body is sick, the body is sick. <clears throat> so, and God says in verse 12 at the end there, neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing. Sanctify yourselves. So God is saying to, either, to Israel, you're either going to choose this sin or you're going to choose me. And that's a stark reminder for us of how serious sin is. Uh, it's very sobering. That God won't have fellowship with this transgression, with this disregard for his word or for his law. You know, here in the book, of, um, jo in the chapter 7, God is going to teach his people this lesson. This is an important stage. They've just come in. They've experienced a victory in the promised land. There's a new group of Israelites going forward. They're going to go forward. They're going to do great things for God. This, is, this was their hour to be used by God. The old generation had died off. And it says there in verse 16, So Joshua rose early in the morning. He brought Israel by their tribes. By the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah and he took the family of the Zarites. And he took the family of the Zarites by man. And Zabdi was taken. All the while, God chooses the tribe first. Maybe they were, it doesn't say, maybe they took lots. Then God takes the family. Then God takes the man. All the while, there's a time to repent. But there's no budging. And in verse 18, it says, Then, the, then he brought his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. So here's Achan. He's been sitting in his shame. Now he's realized that God has seen it all along. And in verse 19, Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. Tell me now, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. And that word confess, it means to ag Achan, agree with God. And in verse 20, Achan answered Joshua and he said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. You know, as followers of Jesus, um, we're, it's great to be reminded of Christ's love for us imperfect saints. And um, for us, repentance is a good thing. I love that line in that song. I, I don't know which song it is, but... Um, 
It talks about we embrace surrender. We embrace repentance. It's not weakness. It is strength for our walk with God. And Romans 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrated his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Titus 3, 4 says this. I love this verse. It says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to the mercy, his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus, our Savior, that having been justified or forgiven by his grace, we should become heirs to the hope of eternal life. So praise the Lord, we are not under the law. Yes, sin is still serious to God. There's consequences. Still, we heard last week, even for the Christians, Romans 6, verse 23, that verse we hear it all the time, the wages of sin is death. But that was, that was to us. The, the, the wages of sin is death for us. And, um, but praise God. God so loved the world that he gave us his son. And, uh, you know, and, and we come to faith, we believe, and, and we're necessary, we repent of our sin. And it's that, you know, I just put that out there today, that idea of the transgression, it's that lifelong walk in a particular way, where God's way is this way, God's law says that, but I'm going down this path, and God wants his body to be clean and perfect and white as snow. And so, you know, as a Christian, as a brother or sister, we always need to encourage each other. Brother, sister, listen, you know, you need to turn from this, you know, make that decision. And uh, it's not the time to go to church. It's not the time to just clap with everybody else. It's a time to like, no, I need to pull aside. God wants to work with this. I need to repent. And that's, that's, that's healthy because we want the body to flourish. And, you know, Joshua, this, the valley of Achor, I believe it means the valley of trouble. But praise God, for us, repentance is a door of hope to a new beginning. And God's heart is always to wash away our sins. 1 John 1 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But let's pick this up in verse 21 of Joshua 7, and I'll take a drink. We see the progression of sin, and this, this is useful for all of us. Verse 21, when Achan, he confesses and he says, when I saw among the spoils of a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted and I took them. And there they are hidden in the tent with the silver. So our challenge as living our life in the spirit is that we need to learn to apply God's word, the, God's truth, which is our shield. We need to apply it to our lives. James 1 verse 14, it says, it talks about this progression of sin. This is what we all need to know, right? But, and be reminded. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. And that's the desires of our heart. And enticed. And then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, it brings forth to, to death. And that's our challenge. There's that progression. Um, Achan what did he do? He said he saw it first. From seeing it, he coveted. He was like, I like that. I want that. And then he took it. So our challenge is, is to strike quickly at the first part of that. When we see it, what, what is it? Or when we, yeah, when you sense it, you touch it, you feel it or whatever. You feel anger. It's like, okay, that's the time to cut it off. You see pornography, right? That's the time to stop. And that's what God's word, that's how God's, his truth is a shield to us. So we need to know these things. Last week, we talked about this incredibly 
powerful. Steve talked about it. He's going through the book of Romans. Incredibly powerful truth. It's like, oh my goodness. Brian taught the week before, and that, that psalm, it says, power belongs to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin in our lives is remarkable, right? Only God can change the leopard spots. He can change us. Look at this, Romans chapter 6. And if, if you want, check out last week's message. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. I don't want to preach last week's message, but this is worth saying, right? Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, know it, that our old man was crucified with him, with Jesus. That the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Dude, this is remarkable. It's like, so when my um, uh, computer drive that you put in the side of the computer to transfer the verses onto the computer, when it amaz- miraculously goes missing this morning, and I'm flipping out in the house, God says, John, you don't need to flip out. It's because the body of sin, what does it say? We're no longer slaves to sin. I don't need to, like, bah! I don't need to. God says, I don't need to. So this is God's truth. And here's the challenge of of the book of Joshua, that we need to appropriate God's promises. We need to possess them. These are our possessions. And we need to take them and bring them into our lives. A lifelong challenge. But God is the God who fights our battles. And, you know, I thought about this. I'm going ahead of myself here a bit. But I thought about this, how last time I thought, the book of Jericho, or Joshua chapter 6, Jericho, God says, like, you don't need to fight this battle. And I was thinking about, and that was the battle for the land. But I was thinking about, man, this battle of our flesh, the, the battle within, like the flesh, part of us wants, like, I want that. And God is saying, no, no, go this way. But I was thinking, like, this battle is real. We got to fight this battle. But you know what? Um, I'll flip forward to this verse here. In Galatians 5, where um, Paul says, yeah, basically he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But it's by the Spirit that we overcome, by being filled up with the Holy Spirit, by being filled up with Jesus, that we overcome these temptations. By these, so God does fight our battle. He's won our battle for us, but we just need to walk it out. Yeah. So um, that's where we're at. And um, okay, so to conclude, I'll, and I'll start to wrap up. The bush, book of jo- Joshua um, talks about taking ground and uh, that no enemy stands in our way, no sin, and going forward in faith, believing God not going by fear. God loves us. He wants our lives to be defined by victory, not by defeat and sin. But I believe in Joshua 7, it teaches us the very important lesson, two lessons, I believe, uh, the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Jesus said about the, the battle within, he's ta- he says in Matthew 26, verse 41, he says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And um, there is that battle going on inside us. And Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, the flesh, it lusts against the spirit, and the flesh, the spirit against the flesh. So there is a war going on between my flesh and the spirit, and the same for you. And there's that verse I was looking for, Um, Galatians 5, verse 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that the first lesson from Joshua chapter 7 is that whole, the battle between the flesh and the spirit within the Christian. But also there's this lesson of self-confidence. There's a, a verse from Psalm 147, I just thought of it this morning, 
It's a great verse. It tells us about human strength, like, whoa, we can, I can do it. Psalm 147, verse 10, it says, he, God does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of man or in human, human might or in human leg power. And, um, and so that's God wants us completely to rely on him. And that's our challenge, just to present ourselves to God, stay filled with the Holy Spirit, and to apply God's truth to our failures. Uh, Thank God, he gives us examples. And I'm just going to end with this example of Peter. Uh, We all know this example of Peter. uh, And it's a great example of self-confidence. When Jesus predicts, in Matthew 26, when Jesus predicts um, the denial that all the disciples are going to deny the Lord, Um, Peter answers and he says in verse 33, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. What a statement. (laughs) I will never be made to stumble. So Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter replies, 35, he says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. So that's the statement of a confident man, confident in his own abilities. Again, in Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus says to them, he says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So Jesus prayed, the prayer of Jesus, is that Peter's relationship with Jesus won't fail. That's what Jesus' prayer is. And Peter says to him, uh, but he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And again, Jesus says that line about the rooster. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was the one with the sword. You know, he was living out his self-confidence. But um, he was self-confident in his own abilities and his own spiritual position. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands. When you compare that to what Jesus said, Jesus said the flesh is weak. So that's like something that's there for us as Christians. That's there whether we think we stand or not. And it's important that we recognize how unspiritual the flesh is. And that's a nice way of saying it. The flesh is not spiritual. And God says the heart, it's deceitfully wicked above all things. And this is very humbling. So Jesus says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. You know, our failures, they rock us. They humble us. And, um, and they should. You know, God doesn't want us sitting in defeat, but God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As Jesus was taken away, <clears throat> he looked into Peter's eyes, and um, I'm sure Peter was shattered by all of this, Peter's failure. But uh, Jesus has pr- had prayed that Peter's faith would not fail, that he would believe, not fear, that he would be, not be discouraged. And I believe that Peter found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Jesus restored Peter. You know, on the day of uh, the resurrection, Jesus says to the women, he says, and tell Peter. And, um, and he used him, encouraged him to go and encourage the disciples. Peter was the first to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And, but Jesus allowed this sifting of Peter to take out the bad and to, to, to go forward. You know, because God, Romans 8, verse 28, all things work together for, for good because God is conforming us to the image of Christ. Our defeats, they are, they're, they're a door of hope. Uh, similarly, with the, the story of Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua learned big life lessons here. Um, teaching us about God's plan of the flesh, and that is it has to die. A little leaven 
it leavens the whole lump, that there's no room for compromise or to settle in sin, but it has to be cut off. For us to walk in the Spirit, we have to go forward prayerfully as well. And that's a, that was a challenge for me, the self-confidence. But secondly, the prayerlessness. You know, when we notice our prayer life is just going down or just like, what's going on? That's a, that needs to be a warning to us. And um, that needs to be a warning to us. So I'm going to finish with just the words of that beautiful song. <clears throat> Remember, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But without him, we can do nothing, right? And this is that beautiful song. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and our griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. I'll pray. Lord, we love you and uh, thank you that we're here today because we love you. And uh, Jesus, thank you that you want your bride to be so beautiful and clean, Lord. And um, thank you that you fight our battles, Lord Jesus. Lord, we do pray um, that we would embrace um, surrender, Lord, and repentance, Lord, in our, in our Christian walk, Lord, that we won't sit in defeat and discouragement, Lord, that we will run back to you, Lord. And um, Lord, Lord, thank you that when we repent, Lord, and if today is a day, Lord, where, where I or where one of us needs to repent, Lord, we pray, Lord, you do that work in our hearts, that we would be on board. We wouldn't rush out from here, Lord. So, Lord, we do pray um, for the, the washing and the regeneration, Lord, of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask today, as your children, would you pour out your Spirit afresh on us today? Empower us, Lord, to walk humbly in your Spirit, Lord. Lord, just, um, yeah, just thank you that you do fight our battles. You win, Lord. Thank you for your promises. Help us to, to appropriate them, Lord, and to possess them. And uh, just bless us all today. Help us to, to just worship you now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.